master of sword, zen, and calligraphy of Shodo too. The people who were recruiting them were Yamaoka Tishu. Yeah, so this is what I love about the Bakumatsu period. He died sitting in Zazen facing towards the imperial palace. Minasan konnichiwa! And welcome to Shogo's Classroom! Today's theme is actually about my favorite samurai, Yamaoka Tishu! Yay! Thank you so much for coming everyone! So I completely understand what you're thinking right now when you heard, wow, let's ask Shogo. Shogo's finally going to be talking about his favorite samurai. Who is he? Is it going to be Miyamoto Musashi? Is it going to be Oro Nobunaga? <laughs> Toyota Hideyoshi Toko Ayasu? Sakamoto Ryoma! <laughs> and here we are, Yamaoka Tishu. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Shogo, thank you so much for this video. I'm going to be going and watching your other videos now. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Give me just a little bit more time. I'm going to be talking about everything you need to know about Yamaoka Tishu through this video. And by the end of watching this video, you'll be in love with Yamaoka Tishu as much as I am. So I really hope you can enjoy watching this video. I was wanting to talk about it for a really, really long time. So I have prepared two slides today. In the first half, I will be talking about the life of Yamaoka Tishu. I'll be explaining about how he lived through his life in four different sections here, as you can see. And also in the second slide, I'll be talking about the four main things that I really admire about Yamaoka Tishu too. So I really hope you can enjoy. Um, the second slide especially is completely my personal opinions. <laughs> if you actually know about Yamaoka Tishu already and are in love with him, please let me know in the comments about what you think is amazing about Yamaoka Tishu. And also, yeah, of course, please let me know about your favorite samurai as well. Yeah, so I'd love to get started right away. But before I do so, I actually have Kazu here. Hello. And also my channel members are watching me through a different camera here. So if you're interested in talking with me through Zoom about 30 minutes before filming the Shogo's Classroom and also watching me record this live, it'd be great if you can join the channel membership through our description box too. In this channel, you can take a closer look at Japanese traditional culture, tips on traveling to Kyoto, and social problems in Japan. So learners and lovers of Japanese language and culture, be sure to subscribe to enjoy more content. So So we're going to get started, the life of Yamaoka Tishu. Now, before I start actually going into his own life, as you can see here, I'm going to be talking about the time period, very briefly, where he was alive. But the reason why I'm going to be going through this very briefly is because, as you can see, it's the Bakumatsu, <laughs> Bakumatsu period, which I've been talking about so many times before whenever I talked about Sakamoto Ryoma, Saigo Takamori, Shin Sengumi, all of these people are alive during the Bakumatsu period. Basically, uh, the most easiest way to, to understand it is that this is the very turbulent civil war era. You know, we have the Sengoku War era too, but Bakumatsu is like as popular yeah, as the Sengoku War period because there was a lot of drama with samurai fighting each other for their own justice and everything. Yeah, and the Bakumatsu period is the end of the Edo period though. And it happened because there was a man named Perry that came from the US and tried to force Japan to open its borders, which were closed for about more than 250 years and come isolated, you know, but they restricted trade, yeah. And Japan was closed for 250 years to protect the absolute rule of the shogunate, the samurai government, but the US came, they forced Japan open, so there was a, a lot of chaos going inside of Japan. One side saying that we should destroy the shogunate to establish a new government to westernize Japan. The other side, the old shogunate said, no, we are going to be continue being the leader even in the new westernized world. So there was a the really fierce battle between the two sides. So it was a very chaotic time. So you can understand that as the Bakumatsu period. So Yamaoka Teshu was born just a little bit before the, Bakuma, the beginning of the Bakumatsu period. You can just jump into number one, raised as a talented swordsman. Now, we call him Yamaoka Teshu today, but his last name was originally Ono. Ono. And Ono was his father's name, obviously. And the Ono family was a very, very talented martial art family. Mm -hmm. And his, even his mother is believed to be a descendant of Tsukahara Bokuden. Now, if you are a Sengoku War era fan, I'm pretty sure you know about his name. He is the, there's, there were two legendary individual swordsmen who are, spent, uh, who are believed to be really, really strong. And Tsukahara Bokuten is one of the two. Mm -hmm. And his mother is believed to be a descendant of such a strong swordsman. And the Ono family has been doing martial arts like for generations and generations. So he was completely gifted by his bloodline already. Mm -hmm. So as he was growing up, although he was born in a rather poor family, the Ono family wasn't such a really um, 
a rich family and such with a lot of power, but he was gifted with an amazing environment, but being able to train in various martial arts. And also I've written here actually, he trained in Shin Kageryu. I'm pretty sure if you are a Kenjutsu or you know EI trainee, you know about Shin Kageryu and Hokushin Ittoryu too. Hokushin Ittori is really, really famous for Sakamoto Ryoma training in it. Yeah, Sakamoto Ryoma is believed to be a really, really strong source of material originally. Yeah, and he trained in Hokushin Ittori. All of these Aduha all exist, by the way. And he trained in Sojutsu too. Sojutsu is a spear. Mm -hmm. And Yamako Teishi also trained in Shodo calligraphy. Now, we always, whenever we talk about Yamako Teishi, we, we, his subtitle of his name basically is the Master of Sword, Zen, and Calligraphy of Shodo too. So when he was 16 years old, he already carried on the 52nd generation of his Shodo Ryuha. He was 16 years old. And throughout his lifetime, it is believed that he wrote more than a million pieces of calligraphy work. So he was really talented in calligraphy as well. Mm -hmm. And as he was training in various things, he grew up to be a very strong man. As you can see in here, he was 188 centimeters tall with a, over 100 kilo in weight. So um, the average height for a Japanese man back in the Edo period especially was around 160 to 165 centimeters. So they're really, really short. Even today, a man who is 188 centimeters tall would be really, really big. Yeah, and also talented in skills of martial arts. He was really, really strong as he was growing up and being a teenager, he was almost undefeatable. He was really, really strong, yeah. However, really sadly though, as he was growing up though, when he was 16 years old, he loses his mother. When he was 17 years old, he loses his father and he becomes on, completely on his own. Yeah, that's a little bit sad there. When he was a teenager, he loses both of his parents. And then from there, moving on to block number two here on this corner, fighting for the shogunate. Now, losing his parents when he was around 20 years old though, because he was so skilled and strong in martial arts and sword techniques and such, he was hired by Kobusho, as it was written here. Kobusho is a martial art training facility that was run by the shogunate. Yeah, so there was a lot of different yuha all training together in one huge organization. Yeah, and he was hired there to also learn, but also teach. Yeah, when he was already 20 years old. <laughs> so you can understand how strong he was at that young age, was already hired by Kobusho. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, Number two, marries a spear master's daughter yeah, and becomes Yamaoka. There was a soujutsu, soujutsu master at the Kobusho, and because the, he was so talented and strong, the spear master's daughter, he was like, you should become my, our son, basically. And that's, the, that's when he becomes Yamaoka. Mm -hmm. And at Kobusho too, not just as he was growing up though, at Kobusho he gained even more experience, got stronger and stronger. And this is around the time when he started training in Zen as well, Zen philosophies, to become mentally strong as well, not just physically. Mm -hmm. And then around here was the timing when the Bakumatsu, the very turbulent Bakumatsu period has started. Mm -hmm. So this is the point where the fighting for the shogunate part starts. Yeah, working, fighting for the shogunate. Number three, as I've written here, becomes a leader of Roshigumi. Roshigumi. Roshigumi was actually a um, organization of random people basically who anyone who wanted to fight can come and join to protect the shogun who was going to be planning to head over to Kyoto safely mm -hmm. because it was already there was a lot of terrorism happening all over the country let's defeat the shogun and you know realize a new era kind of people were you know creating riots all over the place and the shogun was really scared that even the people near him might start riots and attack him. So he wanted to gather more people, bodyguards basically, that would fight for him. So anyone was recruited from any social class in society, anyone was recruited to fight for the shogunate. And to do that, the Roshigumi basically was the people who hired those people. They come on in, okay, that's your name, you know, you, you, okay, you'll okay, fight for Roshigumi and people were gathered and they actually went to Kyoto. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the leader of Roshigumi even though they originally said they wanted to establish an organization to protect the shogun, the leader was actually gathering people to fight for the emperor. Yeah. So as I explained in when I talked about the history of Shinsengumi too, um, the, basically the newer government side, the people who wanted to establish a new government wanted to have the emperor on their side so they would have the right to create a government. Mm -hmm. And the shogun, of course, they are under the emperor too. But basically, the emperor were a power, what should I say, they're existing as a power, but the real political things, you know, the real political power was held by the shogun. So there was two sides, yeah. 
who are you on the emperor's side or are you on the shogun's side? It's basically the battle between the during the Bakumatsu period. Mm -hmm. So the leader originally was gathering all these strong men of different classes to protect the emperor, and the people were like, well, well, this is not what we came for. Yeah. And they all, you know, scattered away. Yeah. And they were basically the Roshigumi was immediately sent back to Edo because they were not gathering for the original purpose, and the leader of Roshigumi was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And because Yamako Teshi was one of the leaders too, right under the top leader, he was actually um, sentenced to punishment as well. But guys, I was mentioning a little bit about Shinsengumi too earlier, right? Doesn't this story sound a little bit familiar? <laughs> this Roshigumi, Roshigumi? Wait, I kind of heard of this before. Yes, it's the Mibu Roshigumi. Do you guys, if you guys remember the originally peasants? The people originally peasants who were training in Kendo, really wishing to become a samurai someday, signed up for a gathering of the people bodyguards to protect the shogun, right? Yeah. The people who signed up for the um, future Shinsengumi members, the people who were recruiting them were Yamaoka Tishu. Yeah, so this is what I love about the Bakumatsu period so much. The, the, all the what glamorous you know, characters that you see in dramas and video games and such, they're actually you know, interacting with each other you know, through these stories. Yeah. So that's the reason why they were called Mibu Roshigumi. The original organization was called Roshigumi, but again, the Shinsugi members, when they heard that the top leader was originally gathering the group for fighting for the emperor, they said, okay, then we're not we're gonna be working for you. But we still want to, to stay in Kyoto, so we're going to be taking the Roshigumi name, but giving it Mibu, which is a city in Kyoto, and they started a new organization on their own, right? Mm -hmm. But the original Roshigumi was sent to Edo, and it was disassembled and taken away, and Yamoko Teshu was actually punished there too. So this, I thought this is a really interesting part, how the Shinsegumi and Yamako Teshu actually were interacting with each other. So basically Yamako Teshu was originally their leader, the leader of the Shinsegumi members. I thought that was really, really interesting. So I was really excited to talk about this story. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, eventually the punishment of course ended and number three, the bloodless surrender of the Edo castle. That sounds really, really scary, doesn't it? Yeah. So this is something that I actually talked about when I talked about the history of Sakamoto Ryoba. Sakamoto Ryoba. Basically, the rebellious side who was trying to fight and defeat the shogunate, there were a few clans that were the leaders of the rebellious people. Mm -hmm. And there was the Choshu Han, Choshu clan yeah, of Yamaguchi prefecture, and there was also the Satsuma clan, which, is, which had uh, Saigo Takamori as the leader. Mm -hmm. And these two clans, originally they had occasions where they fought with each other. Yeah, Choshu clan was the first clan that was really, really um, what should I say, violent, and started a lot of riots, and all the other clans were trying to stop the Choshu clan from, you know, <laughs> trying to fight and destroy the shogunate, yeah. And the Satsuma clan originally was on the side of the shogun to stop them. So the Choshu clan and the Satsuma clan originally fought each other, so they had such a past, yeah, so they were not, even though they had the same goal, they weren't able to get along that easily. Mm -hmm. But because of things to Sakamoto Ryoma, he came together and said, you know, let's shake hands, you know, we have the same goal right now, let's shake hands and work together. And he was the person that established the Sacho Dome, Sacho Dome, the alliance between the two clans. Mm -hmm. And that was a big problem for the Shogun, because the two most powerful clans that were trying to fight them took hands now, and they were coming together yeah, at once. That's so scary. Exactly. The, the Shogun was like, oh no, this is now the end. <laughs> yeah, we're going to end now. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why they did the Taisei Hokan. Basically, this is an act of the Shogunate giving their rights to rule Japan, giving the political power back to the emperor, saying that we are not the leader of Japan anymore. Yeah, of course, the emperor, you are the top leader. We do not have the right, we are not worthy anymore. Please, please take, our, our, we're gonna be giving the rights back to you, kind of thing. And this was just to say that, um, basically because they're not the leaders anymore, there's no reason for them to start a war against them. Yeah, because the Shogun was like, okay, we cannot win. Let's just give our rights back and say, we're gonna be, we're not gonna be fighting you. Yeah, but they were trying to secretly find a way to still rule Japan. Even though they did give their rights back, the Tokugawa family run Japan for more than 200 years, right? So they still wanted to manage their power. And there were a lot of people um, who realized that the shogunate, even though they did not become a shogunate, even though it was disassembled, I'm pretty sure they're still looking for a timing when they would regain power. So that's the reason why, even though the shogunate gave the powers back, the Boshin War starts from there, which is the biggest civil war 
um, during the Bakumatsu period. Mm -hmm. And because this war was really, really savage and violent and the Sacho clans, you know, were coming and attacking, yeah, the Shogun had no will to fight. They wanted to survive through the Westernization era as well. So they said, we want to surrender immediately. Yeah, that is the bloodless surrender of the Edo castle. Edo no mugetsu kaijo, it said in Japanese. They said they want to give the castle to them without any bloodshed, basically. Without anyone dying, they want to surrender immediately. But of course, they are very, very you know, angry and willing to destroy the shogunate, right? Just saying, we want to surrender without any fighting, you know. You won't, they, won't, they might not listen, right? Yeah, so they needed someone to go and negotiate with the Sacho clan, the alliance, basically. And that was Yamaoka Teshu. Yamaoka Teshu was actually chosen for the person who went to negotiate with Saigo Takamori, who was the leader of Sacho, Sacho Alliance, Sacho Dome. And Yamaoka Teshu went almost on his own directly to Saigo Takamori through going, running through the battlefield, obviously, yeah. And he directly went to the top leader to say, we want to surrender, please listen to our request. Yeah. I think this is a really amazing story of Amoko Teshu. How could you possibly, almost on your own, you only had a few servants together with you, mm -hmm. and on, through the battlefield, he went on his own. No one could stop him, basically. That's how strong he was. Just by his atmosphere, no one was like, okay, I'm not gonna be coming any closer to this guy that's running through the battlefield right now. And he directly went to the leader of the rebellious group, right? Mm -hmm. And then Saigo Takamori, it's even more amazing from here. Saigo Takamori, he was like, what the, who the heck are you? You know, just one, you know, a messenger coming directly to me. You know, the top leader talking, who the heck are you? But eventually as they were talking, Saigo Takamori was really impressed and pleased by how loyal Yamakote Shu was, how strong he was, mm -hmm, how much courage he had. And Saigo Takamori was, okay, um, this request is very, very um, surprising, of course, you know, just surrendering without any um, wars happening. But he said, okay, so Yamako Teshu, I trust you. You are an amazing person. So then, you, because you came, let's not start a war. So thanks to Yamoka Teshu, yeah, the, the, um, the surrender, the bloodless surrender actually was a success. Now, probably, no one knows what would have happened in history, of course. This is just a if, you know, that kind of story. But if Yamaka Teshu didn't exist, the bloodless surrender might have not been a success and mo much more people. Some professors were estimating that maybe double the number of people could have died in the Boshin War if the Edon Mukets Kaijo wasn't a reality. So the Yamaka Teshu, his existence was really, really big in Japanese history, especially during the Bakumatsu period. And then finally into the final chapter, number four, dying for the Meiji government. Mm -hmm. So basically, again, the shogunate was disassembled and the Boshin War, the old shogunate side loses and the new Meiji westernized government was established. Mm -hmm. And Yamaka Teshu, who was originally fighting for the old shogunate, of course, would lose all his powers. However, because Saigo Takamori liked him so much, Thanks to his recommendation, Yamako Teshu starts to work as a servant for directly for the emperor. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's amazing. <laughs> Yamako Teshu was originally his enemy that ran through the battlefield to come to him. Yeah, but because Saigo Takamori, the top leader of the Choshu Alliance, was like, no, I cannot just let you die. Now, you are an amazing person. Please become a, a servant for the Meiji Emperor. Yeah. And that is how Yamako Teshu actually worked for 10 years. And the 10 years, by the way, was Yamako Teshu's wish. It was like, no, 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 I am not worthy for, for doing something directly for the Emperor. Please, I'm not a worthy person. But because Saigo Takamori recommended so much, he said, okay, okay, I will do it then, Saigo san. Okay, I will take a re recommendation, but let's just do it for 10 years then. I'm not worthy for doing it my whole lifetime. Yeah, and he actually does a work for the emperor for 10 years exactly. Mm -hmm. And also because he was very um, trained in, in Zen too, around the end of his life, he actually builds a Zen temple himself mm -hmm, to mourn the souls who were lost during the Bakumatsu revolution. Mm -hmm. He even builds a temple and he even starts his own sword style too, just three years before he dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called Itto Seiden. I just love the sound of this new <laughs> name. Muto means no swords. No swords, basically. So you can understand where his philosophies, you know, yeah, his principles 
of not wanting to actually kill someone, but trained to become a stronger person. You can understand it from this name too. I'll be talking a little bit more about this in the second, in the second slide. Mm -hmm. And number four, this is also really amazing. He died sitting in Zazen facing towards the Imperial Palace. Literally, he died when he was doing the Zazen and facing towards the Imperial Palace, who was now his lord, right? Basically, he was now showing his loyalty to the, the Imperial Palace, the Emperor. So he died sitting Zen when he was in his 50s. Oh my goodness. And that is the end of Yamaoka Teshu's life. Yeah, um, to be honest, I'm pretty sure you've already understood how amazing he is. <laughs> yeah. But now let's move on to the second slide and talk about how uh, the parts that I especially think are amazing about Yamaoka Teshu. Then let's move on to the second slide. What's amazing about Yamaoka Teshu? Yeah, um, I could have uh, made a hundred slides actually, but I tried to <laughs> <laughs> make it into this one slide to make this uh, video in a fair amount of time. Yeah, I don't want to be using three or four hours of your day. So I just got to try to put it into these four points. There's even more, there's much, much more, but today I'll be just introducing these four. Let's start from number one. Obviously, obviously he was unbelievably strong. He was really, really strong. Even when he was growing up, when he was a teenager growing up, growing up learning a lot of the martial arts in his family, he was called Onitetsu. That was his nickname. Onitetsu literally means devil metal. The only two people who were called devils in Japanese history was Oro Nobunaga and Yamagote here, so you can understand how strong he was. He proved that being actual strength is not about going up and killing anyone. There was one person that came to my mind when one person showed up and stopped a war from happening. Shaxx from One Piece. Yeah, I'm here to stop this war. 